Good afternoon, everyone. Just watching uh, the attendees come in as we open up the, the door for this Zoom webinar. So I'll give you a few more moments and give Chris a few more moments before we get started, and then we'll do some brief introductions. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today for uh, what promises to be a very interesting topic. My name is Ken Lancastle. I'm with the Mechanical Contractors Association of Canada. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of webinars that were brought to MCAC by Mitsubishi Electric Heating and Cooling. So we're incredibly grateful for their support and pleased to have a, a very, very interesting speaker here with us today. Uh, for those interested in previously recorded webinars, they are available online for anybody who wants to take a look at some of the previous topics. Um, so as I said, today we have a very interesting topic. We're going to look at an overview of air to water heat pumps uh, and the role this technology can play to help us reduce emissions as well as operating costs. So our, our speaker today is Chris DeRoche. He's an applied product, <clears throat> excuse me, an applied product manager with the HVAC division with Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. Um, as a professional engineer with more than 10 years of experience in the HVAC industry, Chris brings a wealth of knowledge to this topic area. Now, before we get started, I would remind everybody that we do have some time for Q&A at the end of Chris's presentation. I would encourage you to use the chat function or the Q&A function in the Zoom application at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation. Um, if there is anything uh, of significance or relevance that you'd like to raise during Chris's presentation, as I said, we'll keep an eye on that and I'll, I'll just prompt Chris with a question during that time. So with that said, I'll turn things over to Chris for today's webinar. And Chris, I will, uh, the Zoom is yours. Perfect, thanks, Ken. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today to talk about air to water heat pumps. Um, so I'm the applied product manager with Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. So as part of my role, uh, promoting a, a relatively niche technology. Um, I spend a lot of time meeting with consulting engineers, contractors, talking about how these are different than conventional systems. So. Uh, for the presentation today that I've prepared, we'll, we'll take a deep dive into air to water heat pumps and, and just talk briefly about the technology and, and design constraints that we have and how they're different than conventional systems. Um, following that, we'll kind of go into why we're going to look at using air to water heat pumps and, and really it's decarbonization and electrification that's really driving that. But um, as we'll see in the presentation, utility costs as well are uh, continuing to make this more economically favorable as well. So it's a win-win for, for air to water heat pumps. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, you know, after looking at some different examples and applications of how you can use it, you'll have a better sense to kind of promote that to your clients as, as a value add for the types of projects that you're working on. Uh, so I'm just gonna shut off my camera to keep the latency high um, and we'll dive right into it. Um, so everyone here, mechanical contractors, um, you know, a lot of people working with hydronics, so everyone's probably familiar with uh, air-cooled chillers. So um, just to speak briefly on air-cooled chillers, this is a device where we're providing chilled water to use in our buildings typically, and we're rejecting heat to the outside through that integrated coil on the machine. In the simplest way you can describe it, an air-to-water heat pump is just that same refrigeration cycle working in a reverse refrigeration cycle. So there's a four-way reversing valve to essentially flip uh, which heat exchangers are providing which function. So in cooling mode, that indoor plate heat exchanger that's connected to the building is providing chilled water acting as an evaporator. In heating mode, it's providing hot water to our building, so it's acting as a condenser. So in order to provide heat to the building, uh, we're actually extracting heat from the outside now. So that big condensing coil on the machine is now acting as an evaporator. So we're sending refrigerant to that coil that's at a temperature colder than the temperature outside so that we can get heat transfer from the air to the refrigeration circuit and then through the work of the compressor um, we're using the condenser to pr provide hot water to use in our building. Um, so heat pump 101, uh, the coefficient of performance doesn't necessarily apply only to air to water heat pumps but uh, VRF systems, packaged uh, air handling equipment, it's just the ratio of the heat output divided by the power input. Um, so even whenever you rate one of these uh, air to water heat pumps at the extreme operating conditions of what you'd uh, typically use them in at minus 10 or minus 15 Celsius ambient, uh, the COP is still 
a little bit above two, about 2.1. So if we're comparing that to an electric resistive boiler, um, that still makes a lot of sense. It's half the operating costs and, and half the amount of energy that, that we're using because of the COP. So think of it as a, a bit of a performance booster. <clears throat> um, so diving right into uh, central plant applications, just talking about typical two pipe changeover systems. Um, I'm presenting today from the city of Toronto and uh, uh, City of Toronto has has a lot of uh, vertical stack bank low unit systems that have typically chillers and boilers that are operating seasonally. So in a two pipe changeover system, we only have uh, one set of pipes supply and return. So in the summertime, we're using our chiller to provide chilled water to air handling units or fan coil units throughout the building. In uh, in the winter and the fall, we'll we'll turn off the chiller and usually we drain the chiller and then operate off the boiler for the winter. Now providing hot water to everything in the building. So if we have a reversible heat pump that can be both a chiller, but also a quasi boiler, um, then why don't we use these technologies more generally? Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, typically going back five years ago, natural gas pricing was pretty inexpensive and there wasn't as much of a drive towards decarbonization and electrification. So we're gonna talk today about how this can be used and leveraged for energy and greenhouse gas emission savings. Um, so really most applications and the low hanging fruit for, for the contractors on the call today to add value to your customers is really instead of replacing air cooled showers like for like when you come across them, you can add value to your clients by promoting the air to water heat pump, put it to work instead of shutting the chiller down um, at the end of the cooling season. Um, so I'll say right now in most applications for this technology that's available on the market today, whether it's from Mitsubishi Electric or from, from other manufacturers, um, typically the best you'll find for operating envelopes for this equipment is a minus 20 cutout. Our product works down to minus 15, but you generally have a lower water temperature at those extreme conditions anyway. So 95% of the case uh, throughout Canada, with the exception of Vancouver, um, where it's a little bit milder, uh, we're going to need an auxiliary boiler. And, and the market's kind of accepted that. It provides resiliency and redundancy as we'll go through it. Um, so before we get into applications, we'll just do a brief uh, overview for anyone who's not familiar with the technology of the air to water heat pumps and how they're different and how they can be applied. Um, so really it's important to understand how the air to water heat pumps different than conventional boiler design um, so that we can design our hydronic system around the heat pump instead of doing just a chiller boiler design and then trying to fit the heat pump into it because we do need to design it a little bit differently. Um, but really the ambient air temperature outside, since this is an air source heat pump, that's really going to drive a couple things that we need to watch out for. Uh, the first key thing is our supply temperature will reduce. And this is referred to as the operating envelope. Um, as it gets colder, it's harder for the machine to extract heat from the ambient surroundings. So uh, we'll have a capacity reduction as it gets colder outside. And since our coefficient of performance is tied to the power input and the capacity provided, if our capacity is reducing, then it's natural that our coefficient of performance will reduce as well. Um, so we'll dive in and kind of address these one by one, uh, starting with the operating envelope. Um, so this is the operating envelope for the particular product that we sell um, through Mitsubishi Electric for commercial air to water heat pumps. Um, so on the Y axis here, we have uh, our heating supply temperature on the Y axis and on the X axis, we have our ambient temperature outside. Um, so whenever you look at our catalog uh, or any manufacturer's catalog, you know, they, they typically don't publish the operating envelope, uh, but in catalogs, we'll say, you know, hot water as high as 55, uh, which is true whenever you look at the operating envelope, but whenever you look, you'll see that you can really only provide that 55 degrees between three and 10 degree ambient. As it gets colder than three degrees, your supply temperature will drop off. So all the units in the ranges that we offer can provide you 45 degree supply temperature at minus 10 outside um, or 35 degrees down to minus 15. Some of the smaller units can do about 40, uh, but generally you're dealing with this lower water temperature. Um, so here I'm talking just about the design temperature for Toronto, which we're, um, is typically somewhere around minus 23 Celsius per the Ontario building code. Um, and that's what you know, according to the building permits, we need to design our heating systems too. If we look at ASHRAE weather data, though, if we look at the 99.6 design temperature, um, dry bulb temperature for winter for city of Toronto, Pearson Airport, it's about minus 18.5. But if we look at the 99% value, it's a little bit warmer at about minus 15. But unless you're designing a low temperature uh, heating system, um, so maybe low temperature uh, panel radiators or radiant in systems, 
you're probably not going to use this product all the way down to minus 15. So usually I recommend to, to engineers and designers, whenever you're trying to design these types of systems, um, this point here, point number two, is a good balance between having a, a warm temperature that you can still get good heat transfers in your heat emitters in your building if you're sizing them properly for new construction or retrofits versus having a broad range where you can get that temperature consistently because that's one of the reasons why boiler design has been uh, very easy in the past. If you're designing a system at 140 Fahrenheit, 150 Fahrenheit, you know that you have that same temperature available at all times from the boiler. What's challenging is designing with the heat pump that might fluctuate its supply temperature as it gets colder, as we see here. Um, but as for designers, they want to make sure they have the same consistent temperature available at all times. So you're usually going to pick a fixed point for that. So if 45 C is too low of a supply temperature for your system, you know, 50 degrees, the units can provide it down to minus five. Um, so that might be a little bit more suitable depending on the application. Um, so it really depends on the building and the type of heat emitters that are used, whether it's new construction or retrofits. Um, the other point that I want to um, point out here is point number one. So this is looking at traditional condensing boiler temperature designs where we're designing for 140 Fahrenheit supply, 120 Fahrenheit return, which corresponds to roughly 60 degrees Celsius and 50 degrees Celsius return. So what's really important about this is, yes, if we're doing a design for a boiler system where we need, say, a million BTUs with 60 degrees Celsius, we do need that. But when we're designing projects, we need that design supply temperature and design capacity for that design rating condition of minus 23. But really, that condition only occurs for about 1% to 2% of the time, extreme peaks. Uh, the rest of the year, it's usually warmer. And when it comes to boiler design, usually modern systems today should be put on outdoor reset curves where as it gets warmer, we're actually dropping the supply temperature in our system. And we can actually maintain better indoor thermal comfort by putting uh, systems on reset curves. We don't have temperature swings on a milder day of say five degrees where your heating system's blasting out at the maximum supply temperature. So depending on the type of building, there could be that natural intersection of your outdoor reset curve corresponding to this envelope where you could select your operating point. Um, the other point too is if you have, for example, at this point number one with a typical condensing boiler, if you need say a million BTUs designed, your heat loss at minus 10 compared to minus 23 is going to be less than whatever it is at point one. So the warmer it gets, the less heat load that we have. So this could be maybe 66% or 75% of whatever our full load is. So this needs to be weighed uh, whenever we're doing our selections as well and, and evaluating if the heat pump is a good fit. Um, the second point that kind of changes is the uh, capacity of a unit. So if you look at um, this particular curve here in blue, uh, shown here with a dotted line, this is showing us a heat pump's capacity according to the ambient temperature from minus 15 up to plus 15. And in gray here, we're looking at that heating load profile from the building. So going from 100% at our design condition, shown here as minus 15, and our heat load's less than 100% as it gets warmer. And then as we get kind of above 10 degrees, we're kind of exiting heating system, heating season. Uh, so we don't really need a lot of heat to the building. But what's important is if you're looking at any manufacturer's catalog, um, catalog ratings are typically based off AHRI 550, 590 standard, which is actually rated at about an eight degree ambient temperature. Um, so in this example, at point one with this dotted line, we had a, a unit that was nominally selected for 139 kilowatts capacity. And this corresponded to having 100% uh, of the capacity provided from the heat pumps at that point. But you'll see as we get a couple slides ahead that we actually don't see these super cold temperatures in the city of Toronto and other climates that frequently. So oftentimes we can reduce the cost of the systems and reduce the footprint and, and the capacity of the heat pump uh, by choosing what's called a bivalence point. So bivalence just means we have two energy sources in the system. So shown here with the heat pump and a boiler. Um, so this point here would be corresponding to what we refer to as an application rating condition of say a minus eight degrees Celsius leaving water temperature from the heat pumps. Uh, so in most cases, you're basically gonna choose this switch over temperature based off the supply temperature that you can work with in your system. So in this example, we'd switch over below uh, about minus seven or so because that corresponds to, in, in the particular example of having a supply temperature of about 48 degrees Celsius to use in our system. So we can reduce the cost and the sizing of our heat pump by considering this, but again, uh, really the low hanging fruit for this type of technology is really chiller replacements, 
instead of replacing a chiller like for like, upgrade it to the heat pump, get your clients to spend a little bit of extra money um, to now put that unit to work in the winter when they normally shut the chiller off. And in most cases, you're going to size it based off the cooling requirement that's needed. Um, and then whatever you get out of it and heating you get, and then supplement any missing capacity that's required with the auxiliary boiler. Um, but we're running that for an infrequent amount of time. Uh, so the third thing that will change is our COP. So uh, this chart is showing us two things. So on the left-hand axis, we have our bin hours. Um, and this is data for the city of Toronto. Um, so this is weather data that I've been collecting over the last four years. Um, I don't have it updated for this last winter that we had, but it doesn't really change the data too much. Um, so this is kind of the profile we're looking at. So for Toronto, we might hit a winter design extreme temperature of maybe minus 23, but we see here based off the number of hours, we, we hit that for a relatively infrequent amount of time. So there's 8,760 hours throughout the year um, and below minus 15 Celsius, Toronto spends about 50 hours and below minus 10, we spend about 200. Um, so this is kind of showing us two things as well on the right hand side, the COP or the coefficient of performance. This is showing us the COP curves. So basically the lower water temperature we can design with the higher the efficiency is going to be. So if we look at an arbitrary point of zero degrees, if we're designing with a 45 degree supply temperature in our system, uh, these ratings are just with water at 100% load. Um, but our COP would be 2.8. So it's still pretty good efficiency. So for every one unit of energy we put into it, we get 2.8 units of energy out. But if we're designing maybe 10 degrees lower, we can actually get 20% better efficiency because for the same ambient condition, the machine doesn't need to work as hard to reach 35 degrees as it does to supply 45 degrees. Um, but again, if we're designing with 35 degrees, this means that we typically need to go to low temperature heating systems, which tend today to be a little bit more expensive. Um, so my point here is that we need to kind of, um, we need to decouple the conversations of operating costs and first costs as two separate things. We need to bring those together and look at everything holistically, because if you're working with your clients saying, hey, you're going to have really good energy efficiency with this system, but you're going to have to spend more money on the heat emitters. You know, this is something that needs to be looked at together. Um, you can pay for it now or you can pay for it forever throughout the lifetime of the system. So yeah, maybe to put in an infor radiant system, it's a little bit more money on the budget side, but long-term efficiency wise, you're going to have a lot more savings from that in addition to the decarbonization uh, that we're going to achieve through that. So why air to water heat pumps? Um, you know, boilers are easy to design with, but when it comes to electrification and decarbonization, um, air to water heat pumps do make a lot of sense today. Um, our emissions in Ontario are starting to go up. Um, there's other like British Columbia and Quebec virtually have zero emission electricity. So uh, it makes a lot of sense in those climates. Compared to 2020, the annual emission factor per kilowatt hour of electricity has gone up in the province of Ontario. Um, so back three years ago, two years ago, it was about uh, 40 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Uh, the estimate for 2022 is about 43, but due to some changes of the energy mix and how we're generating our power, the estimate from TAF, the Atmospheric Fund, um, is projecting that that's going to go up and it's going to continue to go up a little bit, but at the same time, we're going to have more renewables to the mix. Um, so for one kilowatt hour of electricity produced, that, pro that produces uh, about 70 grams today. Of, of CO2 emissions. But if we compare that to a uh, natural gas boiler, if we convert uh, natural gas from cubic meters to kilowatt hours, we're producing about 186 grams of CO2. Um, so this chart here is just comparing the emissions and normalizing it to the heat pump. So essentially we're, we're taking the emissions associated with just an electric resistive boiler, which is this uh, uh, orange line here, and we're comparing that to a natural gas boiler as well, but we're normalizing it to the amount of emissions produced by the heat pump. So we're expressing how many times more emissions are associated with using alternate heating sources. So if we look at electric resistive boiler, which always has a COP of one, um, even at minus 10, when our heat pump's running with it's uh, a little bit lower efficiency, if we're comparing that to an electric resistive boiler, it's still uh, 2.1 times less emissions. But if we compare that to a gas boiler, it's about six times less emissions for the same unit of heat. Um, so certainly as the emissions in Ontario start to go down, or if we're calling in from, from other provinces like Quebec or British Columbia that have very, and Manitoba that have very clean electricity, then 
uh, this number becomes 200 times less emissions and uh, somewhere around 700 for Quebec. Um, but really the name of the game these days is decarbonization and electrification. Um, so the last examples that I had are based out of Toronto, but uh, Toronto is not the center of the universe. Um, let's take a look at some other, you know, winter ashtray design temperatures across country. Um, sorry about that. Um, so in British Columbia, you know, the lower mainland, Vancouver, Victoria, those have very mild temperatures and they're actually designing high rise towers now in those markets where they're using air to water heat pumps and eliminating gas boilers in a lot of cases. Um, and they're also designing their fan coil systems for uh, lower supply temperatures and smaller delta T's from the heat pump. If we go into the inland like Kelowna, then we get a little bit more similar to Toronto minus 18. Obviously the prairies are pretty extreme, but uh, surprisingly in that market as well, they're starting to become a lot more receptive to alternate uh, heat pump technologies instead of natural gas. Uh, Southern Ontario is not too bad. We're pretty mild here. Toronto and London um, and Windsor are a little bit warmer and uh, Maritimes are also uh, a little bit warmer as well. So kind of that minus 15. Um, but what I really want to illustrate is the weather data because yeah, like even in the prairies, it gets down to minus 40. Uh, we do spend a lot more time below minus 10. Uh, if we look at the city of Toronto, you know, I kind of group them into to, to medium to high temperature applications uh, on the left, medium temperature applications in the middle and, and low temperature applications. And just looking for Toronto, how many hours do we spend below these different cutout temperatures? Uh, so from the heat pumps, you can generally get about 50 degrees down to about minus five. And if you're using backup gas boiler below minus five, we'll have about 700 hours. Um, that we spend below that. So about three to four weeks of the year. But again, we don't spend three to four weeks consistently where it's colder than minus five. It's usually an hour or two here in the middle of the night between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. Uh, so certainly by having energy storage in the form of buffer tanks in the system, we can provide a little bit of stored energy that we can use um, and run the heat pumps back up to charge that tank when they're able to. If we look at a medium temperature system designing for about 45 supply temperature in our system, we can run that all the time down to minus 10. And now we're using backup boiler for about 200 hours or low temperature application. We're talking uh, under 50 hours that we spend below minus 15. So it's all relative, but we can still have good savings when we're, we're running the heat pump in the favorable weather and um, just using that boiler for those uh, few hours that it needs to, to be running for auxiliary. Um, so looking at different climates across the country, just looking at these two points of, you know, a minus 10 cutout or a minus 5 cutout. Vancouver, they don't spend any time below minus 10. Below minus 5, they spend about 27 hours. Um, going to the extreme to the other side of Saskatoon, um, below minus 10, they spend about 1,600 hours, so 20% of the year, or 30% below minus 5. So they're getting a little bit less runtime from the heat pumps, but generally speaking, if we're talking about Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, between minus 10 and plus 10, that's about 50% of the total hours of the year. So over 4,000 hours. So whenever we take into account the load of the heat pump at a COP that has kind of that performance booster, uh, we can still have some significant savings. Um, I've been mentioning this minus 10 cutout temperature and 45 supply. That's really just having a balance between having a broad range. You can get the temperature consistently versus having a supply temperature hot enough to get good heat transfer in our, in our heat emitters in our building. Um, but what's interesting and I like to point out is that uh, for anyone that's working on zero carbon projects, uh, in June of 2022, uh, the Canada Green Building Council actually issued version three standard of the zero carbon design. And this actually allows combustion now below minus 10. Uh, the caveat is that you do need to have a, a transition plan of how you're gonna further eliminate carbon uh, throughout the life cycle of that building. So for example, if we're talking about a retrofit, you know, it could be that our building envelope enclosure isn't due for any kind of upgrades for maybe another five years. Um, so that's been planned in terms of capital project planning. And, and they know that once they improve uh, the building envelope, they're gonna have less heat losses. And then they're actually gonna be able to decrease their supply temperature from their system and now run the heat pump for more of the time. Um, or it could be something like once our boiler is at end of life, we're going to replace it with uh, an electric boiler and go full electrification. Um, so the caveat is that uh, whoever's responsible for the zero carbon uh, certification process does need to provide a transition plan. Um, but the reason I like to bring this up all the time is it's a good signal from, from the Canada Green Building Council that's saying, hey, it's better to do a partial fuel switch today than to wait four or five, six years waiting for new technology to come on the market 
um, to do something about our emissions of our buildings. So it's really just a signal that it's better to do something today than wait. Um, and as you'll see, we can have some significant savings by uh, reducing, uh, by switching to heat pumps. So uh, I just want to talk in a bit more detail about some different applications. Um, so again, grouping these into low temperature heating applications and then maybe medium to high temperature heating applications. On the low temp side, uh, water loop heat pumps or cascade systems are one really good application. Uh, radiant in floor heating, domestic hot water preheating, uh, ventilation preheating, these are all really good applications to use the heat pumps. Really, you just want to design for the lowest water temperature possible to get the most benefit, really. Uh, if you're talking about medium temperature applications, we're talking terminal units, fan coil units, um, central air handling units. So again, for kind of a third party air handler, if you want to adapt the heat pump into it, doing a coil retrofit in itself, um, it's really just more surface area that you need. Um, so in retrofits for air handling units, you can just replace the coil, design it around the heat pump's capabilities. Um, and preheat that and then maybe use a backup gas furnace. So there's a lot of different ways that we can use the heat pump uh, depending on the application. So we'll kind of go through uh, some different systems starting from two pipe up to a little bit more complicated systems. Um, so just simple two pipe changeover systems. Uh, this is shown here schematically. So in blue, you know, in summer we'd run the units depending on the number of units that you're selecting for your system. Uh, you can stage the units to meet the load as it increases throughout summer. And then we'll use our backup boiler. Um, sorry, we're not going to use our backup boiler in, in summertime. In wintertime, we'll switch to the heat pumps and we'll run those and again, stage them to meet the heating load. And then if it's too cold outside for the heat pump to run, or if we're not getting at a particular ambient temperature, the right supply temperature that we need from our system, we'll just use the backup boiler. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to use, or we're going to select usually most cases we're going to size our heat pumps based off the cooling requirement and then whatever you get out of them in heating you get you can add more units to meet more of the heating capacity that's required uh, however this could end up in a certain situation because of the capacity duration you know you might need five units to meet the peak heating load at the coldest temperature um, but maybe to meet the peak cooling load in summer you only need three units so that just really comes down to capital investment you know um, are you going to spend the money on two extra units to be able to provide more heating capacity for those uh, 200 hours, we'll call it below minus 10. Probably not with a dual fuel system with a backup boiler, that can make a lot of sense. Um, so two pipe systems are very common in the city of Toronto um, and, and common in uh, uh, multi-unit residential buildings in a lot of places. Uh, we can also do four pipe systems as is coming up, uh, which is right here. So. Um, in four pipe systems, there's different types of heat pumps. There's uh, simultaneous heating, cooling heat pumps um, that were very popular a couple of years ago. They're starting to get a little bit less popular because engineers are realizing that uh, they don't necessarily have a high proportion of heating load to actually use the heat that's recovered through those types of products. Um, so just looking at two pipe products, you can still use two pipe units in four pipe systems. and we're seeing this trend in a lot of places for value engineering instead of buying more expensive, more complicated uh, four pipe simultaneous heating, cooling heat pumps for anyone who's familiar with it. Uh, seeing maybe smaller heat recovery chillers being used for that base load of heat recovery and then using uh, multiple heat pumps in parallel two pipe changeover to meet the peak seasonally. Um, so by adding three way valves in our system and having a good energy management and control system as part of that, we can actually have individual units working in a four pipe system. And with the three-way valves, we can have those units work to the heating loop or to the cooling loop. So generally we'll size these based off the cooling requirement and stage the units to follow the cooling load. And then whatever units don't need to be enabled in cooling can be set to heating mode to offset any boiler usage. And because of that cutout temperature we were talking about earlier at the start, uh, our auxiliary boiler just tops up any missing capacity that's required. Uh, so looking at uh, central heat pump plants, um, another really good application is cascade systems. Um, so I had an image a couple slides ago of a water loop heat pump system. And these are also common in multi-unit residential buildings and office towers where we can provide four pipe comfort uh, with only two pipes distribution. And we're doing this by having terminal units that aren't typical fan coil units, but these are actually water source heat pumps. So water to air heat pumps. 
So usually with these systems, the best way you could do it would be geothermal from an energy and efficiency point of view. Um, but geothermal is very expensive. So when geothermal is too expensive or not feasible, say it's a retrofit, uh, we can actually, um, we put those typically on a cooling tower and a boiler. Um, but now people are looking for an alternative to that boiler and the heat pump is really good in this application because in winter heating mode for these types of systems, your boiler is really only providing about 80 degree Fahrenheit water. Um, so that can actually work within the air to water heat pump kind of 24 Celsius water where now you're able to have the heat pumps run all the time down to minus 15. So you're covering about 99% of the load. Um, and this is just providing warm water to, to uh, be the input to the water loop heat pumps. And then they're actually producing warm air on the inside of the building. Uh, so these are popular in office buildings as well, where they might need heating and cooling year round. So again, you're providing four pipe comfort uh, with two pipes distribution. From an energy and efficiency point of view though, um, in summertime, when we need to reject heat from that system, um, one could argue that mechanical cooling with compressors consumes a lot more energy than a cooling tower would to reject heat. And I would 100% agree. Um, surprisingly, some owners and, and uh, engineers are trying to get away from cooling tower in some instances just due to the maintenance, uh, the water quality treatment, uh, and also the water usage depending on the type of cooling tower that's used. Uh, one way you can think about it is maybe downsizing a cooling tower. You can use a smaller one and then maybe use mechanical cooling as a second stage. Uh, but if, if, if the design allows for still having a cooling tower as part of that building, uh, one good application is we can still make domestic hot water in the summer with the heat pump uh, and still put it to work instead of shutting it down. But there are advantages to the summer. So, so that system could look something like this, where in the wintertime, we're supplying hot water um, through these valves to the water loop heat pump system. And then in the summer mode, we can switch the valve position and have the heat pump work to make domestic hot water preheating. And I'll cover that in a couple slides. Um, so really, it depends on a couple factors. Uh, in terms of whether or not to use a cooling tower, but it just provides that additional layer of flexibility. Uh, we can take this one step further. I'm not a VRF guy, I'm a hydronics guy, but uh, VRF does have uh, very good applications and can make a lot of sense. Um, so uh, we do have, for anyone who's familiar with it, water-cooled VRF with heat recovery. Um, this is a nice little system where we can actually, through the refrigeration circuit, through the VRF system, we can actually recover heat on the refrigeration side between individual zones that are connected. Um, to different zones in the building through the branch box controller. And depending on the layout, you know, you could have a vertical building with one water cool condenser per unit. Um, so this is just another type of cascade system. We're using compressorized units here um, to basically add heat into the system. So in this instance, you're also getting kind of a second layer of heat recovery. Uh, you're also getting the same thing too with the standard water loop heat pump system, but suppose you have one floor above us that's in cooling mode. So now we're adding heat to the loop. And then if you go one floor below, that's maybe in main heating, then uh, this water is gonna get heated up, but then it's gonna go through this condenser here and get cooled down. So the net effect is nothing. So really you just have a set point for the loop and then this unit can basically add heat or reject heat depending on if the VRF systems in main heat or main cool. So kind of in that shoulder season, you know, above 10, below 20 Celsius ambient, we can kind of just float through our system and exchange heat throughout the building with this type of system at really high efficiencies. Um, so this is just really one step beyond with a specific VRF system, but a water loop heat pump system with just standard uh, water to air heat pumps can work uh, quite well as well. Uh, so I did want to talk about domestic hot water. Um, so a lot of people think that heat pumps can be tied into standard indirect tanks where the heat pump would uh, basically add heat to the tank, but really the frequency of time at which the heat pump is going to actually add heat into that domestic hot water system, the way this is drawn here, uh, really depends on what your tank temperature is. So for domestic hot water, we, we store it at 60 degrees, typically for Legionella, but as soon as the domestic hot water comes off the tank, we mix cold water uh, to that and send it out to the building, usually between 45 and 50 degrees. Um, but just to kind of illustrate this and put it in a little bit of perspective. Um, so if the heat pump's maximum temperature is 55 degrees, but we're storing domestic at 60, then we need to deplete water from the tank and fill it back up with cold water and have that tank temperature low enough for the heat pump to work. 
So if we look at an example of a, a multi-unit residential building, uh, suppose everyone gets up in the morning at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, has a shower, and suppose that we've depleted 50% of the volume in our storage tank for that building. Um, so now our tank was stored at 60, we've replaced half of the water with water at 10. So now our average tank temperature is about 35 degrees. So if we wanna be able to add heat into this tank and the water in the tanks at 35 degrees, then we need a temperature hotter than that from the heat pump to be able to add heat into the tank. We want it typically about five degrees. Um, so in this example, if we wanted 40 degrees for the heat pump to add heat into it, looking at the operating map, you can see that you can achieve 40 degrees down to about minus 12 or so. In reality though, as the water in the tank is heating up, your water in the tank is going to start heating up. So if you only have 40 degrees supply temperature available from the heat pump, you're really only going to be able to heat this tank up to 38 degrees or so. So that's something called approach temperatures. So um, basically, if you wanted to heat the tank up to 50 degrees, you would need a supply temperature of 55, which means you can only do it between 3 and 10. Um, so that's a reality to the physics of it. But if we just kind of forget about that, for an instance, just that high level, you know, looking at the same example, instead of a 50% draw from the tank, a 25% draw from the tank, um, our average tank temperature would then be about 48 degrees. So if we want to heat the tank up more, we need a temperature warmer than 48 degrees to add heat to the tank. Um, so in which case, if we wanted 52 degrees, we could hit that down to about minus three. So really my point is with a standard way of integrating a heat pump to an indirect tank as shown here, um, the frequency of time at which we're actually adding heat into that domestic hot water system is, is actually quite limited because our tank temperature is usually gonna be quite warm and the heat pump, depending on the time of year, might not be able to actually add heat to the system. Uh, so what's starting to become a lot more popular is domestic hot water preheating. Um, so same thing where we have an indirect tank that our heat pump supplying heat to, but we're gonna send that to a domestic hot water preheating tank where we're gonna maintain this tank in this example at about 30 degrees. And we still have our, our storage tank that we're maintaining at 60 degrees for Legionella that's kept at temperature with an auxiliary boiler. And we have domestic hot water usage that's going out to the building. So anytime someone's turning a tap or having a shower, uh, we're sending out this hot water and it gets replaced with this preheated water coming from this tank. But in this instance, that same example, looking at the preheat tank, um, say everyone in the building takes a shower again in the morning, we've depleted 50% of the water here this tank was at 30 degrees, now we're replacing it with water at 10. So our average tank temperature is at about 20 degrees Celsius. Well, if we need 20, if we want to heat this tank back up to the 30 degrees, the heat pump can give you 35 or maybe even 40 degrees down to minus 15. So your heat pump at all times of the year down to minus 15, the heat pump's going to be able to heat this tank back up to 30. Uh, same example of maybe a small draw from the tank, 25% of the volume has been depleted. Our average tank temperature is still about 25 degrees. So if the heat pump's given us 30, it's going to easily be able to heat that tank back up to 30. So from a decarbonization point of view, though, by implementing preheat now in these same examples, if you were to do the math and deplete 50% of the volume, um, your, your average tank temperature here is never really getting below... Uh, 45 degrees. Even if you deplete 100% of this tank, all this 30 degree water comes into this tank, but now your boiler only has to do the lift from 30 to 60 degrees. So we're kind of eliminating the natural gas usage in that way. And if we're, especially in the shoulder season, if, if you think back to the first slide where we had a huge capacity at 10 degrees and a small heating load, if our heat pumps are still sequenced in heating mode, but we have a low space heating system, this is an opportunity where we can still put the machines to work and at, at higher efficiencies, COPs of four or even more, we can actually dump heat uh, into that domestic tank and still put it to use before we switch them into cooling mode for the summer. So one last thing on applications, um, these types of units are quite common to have partial heat recovery available within them. So partial heat recovery is uh, here's your refrigeration circuit with your evaporator. So this only works in cooling mode. Um, so we have our compressor. So we go through our evaporator and we heat up that refrigerant and then the compressor um, makes that into a high pressure vapor. And then we have their condenser where we're rejecting heat. So the D superheater is just an additional heat exchanger that's in series after the compressor and before the condenser. 
and it's recovering 20 to 30 percent of the unit's nominal capacity which is the energy of the d superheat from the refrigeration cycle hence uh, the term d superheater um, so we can actually recover a bit of water uh, we can get hot water as high as 60 degrees so that's kind of hitting the benchmark that we want for domestic hot water in the conventional way that we do it uh, in canada uh, but again the availability with the superheater is really dependent on the load that the machine's working at because it's based off the compressor discharge temperature on the refrigeration side. And the control is pretty simple. You just have controls that's looking at the storage circuit temperature and the compressor discharge temperature. And it says, well, if the compressor gas temperature is hotter than the recovery uh, storage tank, then I have the opportunity to recover heat. So then the controller will provide a signal to open a valve or turn a pump on. Um, so although you can get 60 degree water, because it's tied to the load the machine's operating at, are you going to get a full 60 degrees whenever the machine's operating on a 15 degree day at 30% load? Probably not. So again, designing your heat recovery side to the lowest temperature is going to allow you to hit heat recovery for more of the time. Uh, and it's also going to give you more capacity. If you compare heat recovery at 60 degrees for a 60 ton unit, just going off memory, you're at about uh, 30 kilowatts of heat recovered at 60 degrees. But if you're recovering uh, water at 45 degrees, you actually get two times the amount of capacity and you're closer to about uh, 60 kilowatts of heat recovered. So there's kind of two benefits to dropping the supply temperature. And if we're designing our, our, our heat recovery system to either low temperature heat emitters to use like in reheat coils, or domestic hot water preheating again at a low temperature, then we can still maximize the value with that application. Uh, so again, in cooling mode, this is when our main heat exchanger is providing cooling. So if we're talking about a two pipe system, uh, our secondary heat recovery exchanger could be dumping heat into domestic hot water preheat. Or in a four pipe system, we can actually just preheat our boiler water before it. Uh, the return side, we can heat it up through the, the desuperheater and then we're putting less load on our boiler in that sense. Uh, so I'm going a little bit over, so I'm going to try to get through this last section here pretty quick. Um, just wanted to talk uh, generically about hydronic systems. So if the drive is for decarbonizing hydronic systems and we want to keep designing our systems hydronic, um, what are our other choices? We have a natural gas boiler that will always have a COP less than one. Uh, we have an uh, electric boiler that always has a COP of one for electric resistive heating. And then we have an air to water heat pump that will have a COP anywhere from two to four or more, depending on the conditions. Uh, but what I wanted to do is just compare um, providing the same amount of heat from these three different sources because the building doesn't care where the heat comes from. It just wants to maintain that capacity. So um, if we compare them and look at different types of systems, really dual fuel does make a lot of sense because you have resiliency and redundancy. A lot of the market thinks that we can just take all the gas boilers that are out there and change them to an electric boilers and, and pat ourselves on the back and call it a day we've decarbonized our buildings. Uh, it's just not really feasible. Um, it's not a scalable solution. The grid in most markets of Canada, probably all of them, uh, don't have enough electrical capacity to just change all of those heating BTUs from gas to electric. Um, but also you're, you're fixing your building energy source to an all electric system. Um, if you do go with a backup electric boiler. So again, the drive is for decarbonization, but considering the fact that we're running heating for a relatively infrequent time on our auxiliary boiler, um, the heat pump can still offer a lot of benefits and then the boil we're using for a relatively infrequent amount of time. Um, but this is providing building owners with resiliency and redundancy. They can operate their building off the lowest operating cost, depending on if it's lower cost for natural gas versus heat pump. Ontario has announced recently ultra low time of use pricing of, I think, two cents per kilowatt hour overnight. So for sure, you're saving a lot of money by using the heat pump at nighttime, as long as the ambient temperature is uh, suitable. Um, so it can make a lot of sense. Um, but just looking at a carbon side, um, I did, I have some other examples, um, but I had to kind of condense it for this presentation and simplify it. But if we just convert natural gas and electricity to kilowatt hours and just compare the energy savings that we'll have in terms of kilowatt hours from the heat pumps, Doing a simple fuel switch of using the heat pump down to minus 10, shown here from this green triangle, and then using backup gas or electric here. Whether you're using backup gas or, or backup electric, um, doing that fuel switch actually has about 50% kilowatt hour uh, energy reduction. I didn't include that slide because it takes a little bit of time to go through, but what I wanted to illustrate is the carbon savings. 
So based off that 70 grams of CO2 per electrical kilowatt hour, and then also looking at natural gas, uh, that 186 grams per kilowatt hour. Um, if we convert everything to uh, kilowatt hours and do the comparison, so running off the heat pump and then backup gas or electric, this is our, and then comparing that to only a gas system or only an electric system uh, serving the building based off this arbitrary load profile with gas or electric. If we do all gas, we're at about 200 tons emitted per year. Electric boiler is just over 50, but any combination of the heat pump with backup gas or electric is still below. So if we're doing a minus 10 cutout, our COP is still 2.1. So all these bin hours that we're using times the load times the COP is leading to less energy consumption. And whenever you compare the emissions of electricity to run the heat pump or natural gas, we have about 150 tons offset per year. So what does that mean when we look at carbon tax? If we have 100 tons offset per year, the tax in effect right now is $65 per ton. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit and I'll come back to this. Um, $100 uh, offset per year times the tax of $65 is $6,500 offset per year. But in 2030, when the tax is at $170 per ton, um, $170 per ton times 100 tons is $17,000 annual savings. Um, I just wanted to cover off real quick how to compare the operating costs. Um, so the recording will be available and uh, we'll make the slides available to MCAC as well. But if we want to calculate or break even COP from the heat pump, if we just express it in terms of our utility cost for electricity and natural gas, if we express it as a ratio of, of prices between electricity and natural gas as a function of the boiler efficiency, we can figure out the break even COP that we need from a heat pump. Um, so I'm on the condo board for, for my condo building in Toronto and I've been looking closely at our energy prices and in January, um, natural gas is coming down. I'll, I'll qualify that. It's probably at about 45 cents per cubic meter now. Um, but from January, just for the sake of this example, at 50 cents per cubic meter for natural gas and 14 cents per kilowatt hour, when we convert everything, uh, we'll find that in 2023 based off these costs, if our COP if we're comparing it to a 95% efficient boiler, if our COP is above 2.67, we're actually saving money over natural gas. And if we're comparing to an 80% efficient boiler, we need a COP of 2.25 in order to be cost neutral. Um, so, the, so the way you would do is just plot this for whatever boiler efficiency you're looking for based off the costs. You know, you can look at the bills for your clients. Um, based off the cost ratio, you draw a horizontal line over. And then if you're comparing it to a 95% efficient boiler, draw a horizontal line down and this tells you your break even COP. Um, so 95%, we need a COP of about 2.67. If it's an 80% efficient boiler, it's about 2.25. But how does this correlate into the carbon tax? So under the previous uh, carbon tax structure, we had tax going up by $10 per year, which translated into just about two cents year over year of a price increase per cubic meter of natural gas. Now the tax is going up by $15 per ton uh, per year until 2030. So that translates if a, into three cents increase year over year. So we're going to have seven more years of three cents year over year increase. So there's going to be 21 cents added to the cost of natural gas between now and 2030. Um, so if we look back at those COP curves from the heat pump that we were looking at in 2023, um, based off 14 cents per kilowatt hour and, and 53 cents per cubic meter natural gas shown here, this is what our break even COP is uh, required in order to break even. So if we have a 45 degree supply temperature today, this is economical down to about minus one. Um, but as the carbon tax increases and escalates by that three cents year over year, you'll see the break even COP that we need to break even gets lower and lower. So by 2030, it's closer to two. So what might be installed today with a 45 degree operating temperature that's economical down to about minus one by 2030, uh, the break-even COP line is actually lower than our COP uh, at this point here. So that means it's actually saving money all the time. Um, and just to kind of put that in perspective too, for carbon tax savings, again, I've been looking closely at the bills on my condo board. And in 2020, um, for natural gas, just due to the carbon tax increases and also increases that we saw in 2022 due to the conflict in Ukraine, um, this is how our total natural gas pre-tax amount that we've been paying has increased from 2020 to 2022. So basically increased by pretty much 70% over 2020 values. Um, but federal carbon charge is actually a line item on the bill. 
and 2021 carbon tax was about 27 percent of our total pre-tax bill just went to the federal uh, carbon charge program in 2022 the commodity price did spike because of the conflict in ukraine so that percentage went down because the the price of gas itself went up so much um, but still close to forty thousand dollars paid for that so that's money that owners can maybe put towards decarbonization projects this is just showing that break even cop trend going back from 2020 to 2022 um, so even at the start of 2022 you needed a cop of four to be cost neutral and at the end of 2022 it was below three um, so again the economics are shifting more and more in favor for the heat pump so I just wanted to finish off real quick with just uh, an example here on chiller retrofits. So low hanging fruit are chiller retrofits, but they are different than conventional systems uh, with a couple ways. But uh, these monoblock type heat pumps, monoblock just means it's a packaged unit and you have water connections between outside and inside. Um, so from a product installation point of view on the roof, it's pretty simple. You put it on the stands, install it the way you would normally install a chiller. Uh, connecting water connections to it and electrical connections to it. On the building design side, it does change a little bit for kind of two key reasons. Uh, chillers we normally drain if they're not working in the winter, they'll have glycol. Well, sorry, if chillers are supposed to be working in the winter, then they'll have glycol in them for freeze protection. Or if they're seasonal chillers, they'll just be drained at the end of the winter. But if we're going to put this machine to work and produce heat in the wintertime, then we need to protect that fluid with glycol. Um, so we do need glycol and we probably don't want to use glycol throughout the entire building due to the cost of glycol itself and the additional pumping penalties that will now spend more energy moving that glycol solution throughout the building. The other thing too that will change is buffer tanks. Uh, so compressorized equipment that's heating water likes to see, compressors like to see long runtime. So to prevent compressors from short cycling, um, we're going to need to put a buffer tank in the system. Um, so I just want to finish this off with a quick example for a retrofit project that we did downtown Toronto. So this is a French Quarter shared facility. It's uh, two condo towers with common parking garage with a central plant on the roof of one building that supplies heating and cooling to both buildings. Um, they had a chiller that was at end of life. Um, so this is a 110 ton chiller um, that needed to be replaced. Um, and we actually fit, it's the same size, a 55 ton heat pump in the place of this. So they actually put in two heat pumps, one in this space at 55 tons and another one on a different portion of the roof that was at 65 tons for the building. But the original drawing um, from original just had a seasonal changeover valve with their boilers and their chillers, no buffer tank. So part of the retrofit, they didn't want to distribute glycol throughout the building um, hydronic system. So they had to decouple this. And this is gonna be probably in 90, 95% of the cases for retrofits where glycol is not really an option throughout the building. So we need to decouple that. So we'll put a heat exchanger on it so we can have our heat pumps operating with this outdoor loop, um, making hot water to go to the heat exchangers. And then your main building return just basically comes back, picks up heat from the heat pump loop and goes back out to the building. And the boiler to not have to put a glycol solution to the boiler, we have that included on the secondary of the system. So the way this system's drawn, the boiler could add supplemental heat on the secondary side of it with the heat pumps running. And this will allow you to also run the heat pumps at a, a different flow rate than on the building side. And the buffer tank as well as just size based off uh, system volume, but any manufacturer you're working with will have the recommendation for how that should be sized. So this is uh, the new heat pump that was put into place. So you'll see it's basically the same size as the other one, but half the capacity and why. Uh, because of the heat pump, in order for it to extract heat, it needs a lot of surface area to extract heat from the air. So they do tend to be bigger. So footprint in retrofits will be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and as well, making sure that you have enough space for the weight for those units. Um, so it's just a quick snapshot of uh, Crane Day whenever they're hoisting it in uh, to place. So this is the mechanical room. So originally where all these heat exchangers and, and piping is, they had an old atmospheric boiler that they demoed as part of the project. Um, to make space for the heat pumps and they had to add buffer tanks. It's a little bit difficult to see, uh, but buffer tanks and heat exchangers and a new pumping configuration. Uh, but just to finish off uh, very quickly, sorry, I'm uh, cutting it a little bit close, but we'll still have a few minutes for questions. Um, based off just if they would have done like for like, based off the reserve fund, they had about $400,000 savings. If for the reversible heat pump with all the ancillary equipment like buffer tanks, heat exchangers, this is installed cost was about 600,000. Um, so the Delta really to upgrade to the heat pump was a difference of about $200,000. 
and with incentives though, this was kind of the infancy of the retrofits available for this type of equipment. I'm expecting this year that there'll be a lot more money up for grabs for, for fuel switching, but 50,000 is not too bad. So the Delta cost was about $160,000. So if we just look at that fee structure for the carbon tax escalating from 65 to 170 by 2030, our annual savings based off uh, 86 tons of carbon estimated um, in 2023 is about $6,000 per year. By 2030, it's about $14,000 per year. Uh, but the cumulative savings over a 20 year life cycle, sorry, 15 year life cycle is $200,000 savings. So um, without considering incentives about a 16 year payback, with $50,000 of incentives, maybe a 12 year payback, but with more incentives that are gonna to start to come online. We'll see these paybacks being under 10 years and, and clients will be a lot more receptive to it. Uh, so again, just to summarize, air to water heat pumps are uh, an excellent retrofit tool. They can be applied in a lot of different ways to achieve electrification. Uh, every building's unique. Um, so whether it's domestic hot water, uh, heating on the air side or heating on the hydronic side, there's different ways they can be integrated. Um, but the economical viability of this is continuing um, as time goes on with the carbon tax to be more in favor of these heat pumps. Um, you know, I work for Mitsubishi Electric. We believe strongly in electrification, but the more I, I talk to the market about this kind of stuff, the more dual fuel makes sense. Uh, we simply just can't do full electrification at scale at low COPs. Um, but for sure, um, uh, on the air to water heat pump side, there's different technologies that have better cutout temperatures. Um, so really, you know, 80% of the low hanging fruit for this will be the retrofit market. Uh, if we're talking about new construction, you know, you're comparing an air to water heat pump that maybe works down to minus 15, minus 20, comparing that to a VRF system that can work down to minus 30 as an example. So these need to be weighed. Um, but the business case is there and the technology is there to have some good energy and cost savings just with simple retrofits as well. Uh, so cutting it a little bit close, but I'm uh, not sure how much long we have for questions, Ken, but uh, we can field any questions that we might have now. I'm available to stay longer if you want to keep going longer as well. Up to you. Well, that's, first of all, I want to thank you, Chris. That was a really uh, technically informative session. Uh, lots of information there. And I, I learned a few things throughout. I, I'm glad you talked a little bit at the end about sort of when those cost savings are realized, because that was one of the questions I, I had written down for you as well. Just touching on that really quick, uh, you sort of mentioned that 12 year payback on that one project and then depending on incentives plus or minus, um, is that what you're seeing consistently in the market in terms of that payback when you're talking to owners and what they can anticipate from uh, sort of seeing the payback on those investments? Um, surprisingly, I'm seeing a lot of clients that the payback itself and the financials, obviously it has to make sense, but that's not the primary driver. Uh, like a lot of owners have ESG mandates now where they're mandated to reduce emissions and that does come at a cost. Mm -hmm. um, I find generally if you're under 15 years, like within the life cycle of the equipment, it makes it a little bit of an easier decision. Um, depending like there, I didn't get into it. I ran out of time, but that's just based off the simple carbon tax method. If you, I don't like to really talk about commodity costs. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what natural gas is going to do over the next five years. Um, but if you do, it is a little bit more favorable based off those rates to just compare it based off the actual utility costs. So you, can, you can get that down to eight years today or so. Okay. Yeah. Now, if we had that crystal ball on commodity prices, we might be doing something different. Uh <laughs> Yeah. Speaking to sort of the industry as a whole, from a supplier perspective, uh, where where are you seeing the largest knowledge gap currently existing? Um, what is it in the design community? Is it in the contracting? Is it the owner community? I think it's uh, more in the design community, to be honest. I think like design build contractors have a really important role to play for adoption of this technology moving forward. I think it's, you know, in cooling mode, it's very similar to a traditional chiller, but when the systems are designed properly, uh, they're very similar. It's really just buffer tank addition and, and some other design constraints. Um, but even engineers, you know, you have some engineers that focus on stuff like this all the time and they're using it a lot. And then you have engineers that are chiller boiler guys that are a little bit more hesitant to adapt, but they know they need to adapt. And I've started working with some engineers that 
you know, we've kind of held their hand throughout the first design of the project. And, and once they get through that and they have the design finalized, they say, oh, okay, actually this makes a lot of sense. And whenever they look at the projected savings, it makes a lot of sense. And then they come back and say, okay, like, yeah, let's, let's do the next project like this. So I think experience is really important. And, you know, what, like I know there's contractors here. I talked to contractors from Alberta where it's totally different markets, you know, and they say, oh, well, this isn't Vancouver. And I say, no, it's not. You guys do spend a lot of time colder. But what I'm saying is you're going to design your system the same way they're doing it in BC. You're just going to use a little bit more natural gas. I think one of the things you talked about earlier on too, is you said, we need to look at some of this stuff more holistically. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate the procurement model doesn't always allow for that to occur. Um, yeah. any, any advice you could offer contractors who are, again, trying to maybe introduce this to some of their owners or consultants and, and what they can do to, to get that in front of them when the procurement model doesn't allow for it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we just need to design our buildings a little bit differently, like central systems, the way we do hydronics now, central systems, we need high temperatures because maybe we're doing reheat um, or needing really high temperatures based off certain heat emitters. Um, but for example, if we decouple ventilation and use a DOAS instead of just a typical air handling unit supplied from our system, we can kind of deal with maybe a high temperature for that, but we're shifting a lot of the load now to something that we can do with a low temperature in the rest of the building and maintain thermal comfort as well. Um, so I think it's, we need to look at ventilation with space heating. And I think we need to building envelope enclosures. That's a bit outside the scope of mechanical contractors, but for anyone who kind of promotes that to the owners, you know, First step, if, if it's cold outside, shut your window first. Same thing applies to the building envelope, right? And that can lead to lower equipment sizing and better efficiencies as well, but outside the scope of mechanicals. So I think uh, any advice would be to work closely with your engineers on those types of things and see where you can find the savings and make it work. Uh, we had one question come in. Uh, what calculations do you use to properly size the buffer tanks? Buffer tank general rule of thumb is going to be about eight liters of water volume connected to the heat pumps per kilowatt of capacity. And, and I cheated a bit when I drew that diagram for the retrofit uh, because originally that retrofit was designed with originally, sorry, my computer is going too slow. Buffer tank that I showed here. Um, this is how they originally designed it. Um, due to lead times and cost during COVID, this was a 2021 project. They actually split it up into a smaller buffer tank and a smaller heat exchanger for each unit. Uh, but what the drawback to that was in part load situations like we have this time of the year, with individual buffer tanks, the compressors were only running maybe three minutes. Um, but the advantage to piping it like this with like the more water volume, the better, and that's thermal inertia. So that's just gonna, cause you're gonna get that tank up to temperature in the winter. Um, and then your tank's gonna kind of operate between your design supply and design return. So by having that big water volume, it's a lot better for the units whenever only one unit's running with one compressor and dealing with all of the water in this tank, as opposed to two smaller tanks. Now you basically cut that volume in half. So really the, the message is the more water content in the system, the better. Um, too much can be too bad. Um, but generally if you're between that six to 10 liters per kilowatt, that's kind of the sweet spot. So, Chris, I'm not seeing any more questions come in right now, um, but I saw that you left your, oh, excuse me, there's one more, typical expected system lifespan? Uh, usually about 15 to 20 years, typically. Um, depends really on maintenance. Uh, so for our product, we recommend quarterly maintenance, cleaning the coils, you know, checking everything. Uh, compressors will naturally have a life cycle, so they'll need to be replaced after, I think for scroll compressors, 8,000 to 10,000 hours, something like that. Uh, but generally uh, 15 to 20 years. Great. Same as a conventional chiller. That's great. Um, I saw that you left your uh, your email address at the, the last slide there. And 
I think you mentioned you're okay with us distributing this. So um, if there are any other questions, I would encourage anybody to reach out to us or to Chris uh, directly. Chris, I want to thank you again for your time, your expertise on this. As I said, it was a very informative session. Uh, I took a lot away from it and looking forward to uh, maybe having you on for another session as, uh, as we start to see more of this in the future. So appreciate you um, taking the time and thank you again to Mitsubishi Electric Heating and Cooling for uh, helping us put this on. Absolutely. Thanks. We'll have uh, a lot more case studies next time. Sounds great. Thanks, Chris. All right. Ciao. Thanks. Bye.